Okay. So, um, three minutes late, but anyway, let's <laughs> roll with it. So, uh, this is going to be uh, the last session at today, uh, at this year's Meta Refresh. And um, I'm super excited to have Vincent Hardy with us. Vincent's uh, the director of engineering at Adobe. Um, and I think yesterday was at Sovic's talk that he had a slide which said, the web is an amazing platform. And uh, Vincent's job title is uh, very cool because he's, uh, his team is the web platform team. Um, so that's a, that's a really cool t uh, title to have. And I think part of it is because he's, as he's put it, a web and graphics guy. He's got a whole bunch of, he works on the SVG uh, working group, defining the standards and developing them further. And I think some of that is going to be reflected here. So I'm really chuffed to have you. Is it on now? Yeah. It is. All right. Thanks. Thanks. So we're saying thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Um, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to conclude this uh, uh, this conference. Uh, I really enjoyed the conference. Um, I, I seeing that everybody seems to be here. I think everybody enjoyed the conference equally. I. Uh, I really like the talks. Uh, I learned a lot from uh, from the different sessions, uh, seeing what people do, what people, what type of problems uh, we're, we're we're facing as uh, as web developers. Um, I also enjoy the networking and talking to people. I think, uh, and I, I I hope you'll relate to that. I think we learn as much from uh, from the sessions as we do from the the people we meet at the conference and uh, comparing notes, uh, seeing what other people do, and 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 again the problems they uh, they face. Um, so as Raul said, I'm a, I'm a graphics and uh, animation and web geek. I've uh, been working on, on graphics for, for a long time, and that's uh, really what I want to share today uh, with you and, and talk about you know, what's possible on the web today, what's, you know, what's coming, and uh, what will be possible in the not too distant future. Uh, I thought I would start with, you know, why graphics? Uh, you're uh, an audi audience of, uh, of graphic designers. I think you're, you're all sold on, the, uh, on the, the need for graphics. But uh, I think very often we, we lose sight when we're constrained by technology that there is more possible. And the reality is that the web has been a little bit constrained on the graphic side for, uh, for a while. And graphics are really important because in... Um, you know, everything we do when we communicate, uh, visual information is really king. Uh, you know, I, I forgot the exact numbers, but there is this, uh, those studies that talk about, you know, when you talk to someone, uh, when you're trying to communicate, you know, how much of the communication is actually visual and how much goes through the, you know, the voice and what your, uh, your intonation and uh, uh, when you speak and how much is in the transcript of what you say, basically the email. And you really, really the bulk of the communication is visual. Uh, because we're we're visual animals, we we've grown and evolved to uh, to take cues from uh, from from what we see. So that's why graphics are 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 really important. Uh, so I grew up on graphics. Uh, I've heard Asterix is uh, is famous in India. Is that is that true? Do you guys know this? All right, <laughs> very good. So I, I grew up on on comics and and really liking that for uh, for storytelling because this is the other thing I'm uh, I'm really interested in is you know when you communicate you need to, you know graphics are really good for uh, for for expressing what you, you want to say, but you also want to uh, you know, give a story. Uh, for the longest time, I felt a little guilty that I enjoyed uh, you know, comic books so much uh, until I read a book by uh, Scott McCloud uh, explaining it's, uh, his book is called Understanding Comics. And it's a really uh, beautiful piece of work. It's actually a comic book itself, um, but it's about visual communication and, uh, and narratives, and it's ground in uh, you know, the uh, history of uh, fusing images and text combined. So um, when we set out at Adobe uh, uh, on this idea of, of talking about web graphics and the history of web graphics and you know, the unfolding of what's possible, we thought we would do it as a narrative. We would you know, make it a story. And also, we would make it a story that actually uses web graphics. Uh, so we would uh, you know, drink our uh, own champagne. That's, that's a polite way of saying we're, we're eating our own dog food. Um, the, uh, so 
what you're seeing here uh, behind the, the login screen um, is actually in a browser. So uh, the whole presentation is, is running in, uh, in Chromium. Um, and as we've seen, you know, throughout the the conference, you know, I, I was really amazed by the the quality of the of the slide and the the, the, the design of the uh, of the presentation. And it would be really nice if all of those could actually, you know, not always be PowerPoints or keynotes, but you know, really built on web graphics. And I think we're getting close to that point, or we we can in many cases. And I hope in the next few years, you know, we'll see those fellow, those those beautiful pre presentations all done in HTML and published in HTML. Uh, right at the time of the conference or shortly uh, thereafter. So let's start. Uh, so I'm going to start if that thing cooperates. OK. So um, the story starts, the story of the graphical web starts you know, in the uh, early 90s. And we started with HTML. And uh, it's, it's pretty terse, right? I mean, you've got uh, HTML. There's not a lot of, uh, of graphics capabilities. You have three types of graphical objects in HTML. You've got a box, uh, you've got text, and you've got images. And that's it. And uh, so that's where uh, our starting point is. And the other thing we, we thought in putting the story together that I, I need help from, uh, uh, from a little character to go through the story. So meet um, my help. This is. This is div. So do you know what div stands for? Like, what is it? Yes. So it's, um, uh, it's the HTML element. It's not the abbreviation of Divya. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it is the HTML element. And I'll, show, I'll prove it later. It is truly an HTML element. So uh, div is going to go, go through the journey with me. So um, div, are you ready? All right. OK, so that's a blank tag. Uh, so we were, we were pretty well set in, uh, in 1995. But uh, I think that, that's a joke, there, right? I thought you can talk. Sorry, just a little nostalgic. Where to from here? Uh, well, so we're, we're back in 1995. We only have three types of graphical objects and very little rendering control. So I think any, anywhere from here would be better, really. You got it. Though I don't see how it can get better than this. Whoa, hubba hubba. Hello there, Div. Welcome to 1996. I'm Cascading Style Sheet. I can add more style to your bland little world. I'm prettier and more approachable. All right, so do you know that CSS looked that, like that? I and mean, she's pretty, pretty nice, right? Um, so CSS 1996, uh, when, when the web began, actually, uh, there was this really clear direction that it was very important to separate uh, the semantic information, so the information you want to convey from the way it would, it would be presented to the end user. I think that's a really big foundation for the web. Uh, and, and I think at the heart of why it's been very successful, uh, it was a very important architectural decision. Uh, other systems like uh, you know, Java or other things that, uh, uh, technology that existed at the time uh, took a different approach. There was no real separation like this. Uh, this architecture decision made it possible to have on one hand, you know, the thing you want to say be accessible, you know, uh, through by, by servers, uh, by screen readers. Uh, they could be displayed on screen, etc. So it was one one problem is you know defining the semantic, and the other problem was how you would present it. So there were multiple uh, styling system uh, in competition, and CSS is the one that stuck. Um, so there we, we went through CSS1, uh, which was pretty limited. Then with CSS2, we added a bunch of you know, features. Uh, but the spec was not quite there yet. Uh, there were lots of interoperability problems. Uh, if you go you know, several years back, CSS was the one thing people loved to bash on, you know, almost at the same level that people bash on IE6 today. Uh, and um, CSS 2.1 is when really the, you know, the CSS working group clarified a lot of the details about the spec to get a much better interoperability and worked a lot on testing so that now we, we enjoy a fairly you know, substantial level of, of compatibility between, uh, between browsers. At the same time, CSS 2.1 brought new, uh, you know, uh, a lot of new features, better rendering control on, on, on better typography you know, with, uh, with web fonts. So the, the, the features evolved. 
And that, that was a you know, really huge step forward in terms of uh, being able to render graphical information on the web. But at the heart of it, you know, if you combine uh, CSS and HTML, you're still dealing with those three basic graphical objects, which is you know, box, images, and text, and that's pretty limiting. So I think there is, there is you know, clearly a need for, for more, and that's what Dale's gonna talk about next. CSS, you've really made me a better person. Don't take this the wrong way, but it's time I look for more interesting shapes that can scale. It's not you, it's me. Oh, you're looking for SVG. We're good friends. Ah, okay. You count as an interesting shape. I'm not only an interesting shape. I'm every interesting shape. Check it. Wow, your vector graphics. Scalable vector graphics. Want to see? Whoa, awesome. <laughs> so SVG really filled that gap is, you know, going beyond the box. You know, really beyond the, the, the constraint that HTML has. It's not a CSS constraint. It, CSS is a styling system and a rendering system. Um, the, the constraint came from HTML. The, the semantics uh, of HTML expressed uh, those basic uh, elements. There's no shapes or anything like this. And that's the, the, the gap that SVG is meant to, to fill. Uh, SVG, just like HTML, works with uh, CSS so it can be styled. Uh, SVG, just like HTML, has DOM access, so you can script it uh, the same way. It has interactivity. So it's really the graphical uh, side of HTML, if you'd like. Um, if, you know, if we could go back in time, uh, I think I'd much rather have uh, SVG be developed as part of the HTML working group effort, so that we have actually one syntax that has both uh, you know, the basic HTML uh, elements plus the graphical syntax for it. But, you know, I think we'll get there. There's you know, uh, a lot of um, you know, inlining of SVG. This presentation actually uses a lot of uh, inline SVG. So we, we, we started having a lot of uh, really good support for it. There are really important characteristics of SVG and why it's, uh, it's actually a very key standard for the web today. Uh, one is that we, you know, we've talked about it. It's, uh, it's high DPI with you know, the, the multitude of device sizes, but also device resolutions. SVG really fills an, uh, an important role. I mean, you don't want to carry around you know, zillions of bitmaps at different you know, sizes and resolutions uh, where you can express the graphic in, uh, in vector format. And very often, uh, you know, if, you, if, you, if you did a survey of, uh, of the graphics on websites, a lot of them, like a really huge percentage of those, uh, of those graphics can actually be expressed as 2D graphics. And there is really no good reason for, uh, for not making them uh, GD graphics. Now, so that's kind of the low bloat side uh, of the argument. Uh, the other reason why SVG is really important is uh, accessibility. Uh, we had really good talks about accessibility during the conference. But if you imagine, um, uh, say, a, you know, easy data visualization, for example, uh, if it's expressed as a bitmap, it's a black box for a screen reader. I mean, the best you can do is probably a little bit of a description saying, he, you know, uh, line chart here, and that's all you're going to get. Uh, whereas if you express it with something like SVG, you can make it accessible, and the semantics is retained in the graphics. So if you navigated the, the DOM for this, you'll hit uh, a bar which will have, you know, some uh, description or title uh, attached to it that, uh, you know, can be accessible to, uh, to, to various technologies. Uh, you can find what the numbers are, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, uh, it, it retains a lot of the semantic. And by the same token, it can be uh, you know, uh, looked into by search engines. So it's really um, a foundation for uh, expressing really uh, nice graphics on the web. Now, this is still the 2D plane. You know, uh, if you look, uh, HTML, SVG, CSS, you know, great features. You, know, you can do filter effects, shadows, gradients, you know, masking, blend modes all that stuff, but uh, it's still in a 2D world. And there is you know, a big evolution of, uh, of, of web graphics was taking it to 3D. This has been great, SVG. I was thinking, it's time to look for something with, you know, a little more dimension. Three dimensions? Well, why didn't you say so? Let me help you get a little perspective on things. Oh man. <laughs> I've been mooned. Welcome to the Z-axis, Div. I'm 3D Transform, and things just got deep. Like, have you ever wondered if we're all just a bunch of ones and zeros, flicking switches on and off for eternity? 
Wow. What does it all mean? It means we can view things from every angle. Hey, I, I can see my house from here. So uh, CSS transform were, were introduced first on you know, HTML and CSS uh, elements. And now there is a, a single CSS transform spec that unifies all notions of, uh, of linear transformations in, uh, in HTML, uh, CSS, and SVG. That's a really important uh, evolution. Uh, this scene here is, is all built with CSS transform, CSS3 transforms. And it's uh, the illusion you have of a, of a real 3D space is because we arrange you know, 2D surfaces so that you get uh, volume, like the uh, you know the little uh, rectangular uh, shape at the bottom, those are all flat surfaces that are moved into a 3D space. Um, that's that's a huge um, feature for for you know creatives. Uh, with this, you can do a lot of um, you know fun things in narration, like uh, like like so. Uh, but you can also do very nice uh, effects in UI, like UI enhancing features. Uh, there was a talk yesterday where uh, the speaker uh, was insisting that you know uh, subtle effects in uh, in, uh, in user interfaces make a big difference. I think 3D transform can enhance uh, user experiences this way. If you if you flip something around, for example, uh, if you actually have a 3D transform and you do apply perspective, you've got a much natural, much more natural uh, feel to the transition, uh, and that makes it easier for people to understand, and therefore it's a better user experience. So. Well, that you said that this is a, a really important evolution on the web uh, in, in like increasing the, the palette we have as, as developers to, to do uh, more things graphic. Now, uh, so far, all I've talked about is really uh, declarative. So I've, I've insisted on saying, you know, we're, uh, for web graphics, it's very important to have the styling system, you know, abstractions, graphical objects, or semantical objects that we apply the style system to. But sometimes this is not necessarily what you want to do. There, is, there, there are times where you want you know, more precise control or you want to actually do things at the pixel level. And we have technologies for that as well on the, on the graphical web. I'm starting to dream big now, 3D. I want even more out of my graphics. I want to control them on a granular level. If you want granular, you want pixels. Whoa, that's freaky. I'm 2D Canvas. And I can do more than create shapes and colors. I let you manipulate the particles in this universe. The guy's a little scary, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> so that constellation is an example of, of using Canvas 2D, I think, in an appropriate way. So you know, we're talking about how it's important to retain information on, uh, on a web page so that it's accessible through screen readers or through a search engine. There is a case like this where if you want to render it visually, uh, you know, there, there's a zillion little particles that you, you, you want to arrange to create the effect you want, but semantically, uh, none of those particles really carry any meaning. So you, don't, you really don't want to have a DOM node for you know, every single circle, for example, that you draw. This would be like real dead weight on your, on your page. Uh, even if the, the browser could, you know, could handle it, that would still be a bad idea. Uh, so that's an example where the abstraction really is a canvas element and, uh, that you can draw into. And you could, you could say, you know, the, the, the canvas element is my uh, galaxy guy or something like this. Right? And that's enough semantic for it. And then uh, you can draw and, and control every pixel that goes into, uh, into canvas. Now, canvas is really a black box for the web. I mean, that's, that's a level uh, of, of webbiness it has. Right? It's, it's, it's a rectangular uh, set of pixels. And you can use different contexts to actually touch the pixels uh, you want to draw or read. Uh, so the, the context we use here is called the 2D context, and it's a default one. It's defined in a, in a spec in Devil's 3C, and it has a, you know, excellent uh, support across, uh, across browsers. Now, there are other, uh, other 3D contexts, uh, other contexts you can use, and you could imagine many contexts, uh, different drawing APIs to actually touch those, uh, those pixels. At the end of the day, this is all those APIs do. I mean, they may be very powerful, but what they do is they touch pixels and they read pixels. And that's what, that's what is visible from the, from the website of things. So let's see uh, the other type of graphical context we have. Uh, and Div's going to talk about that now. How realistic can we get here? Are we talking mind-blowing effects? Because I'm thinking like Spielberg here. For that, you need to go further into space. I won't lie. This is a little weird. I am WebGL. Here, you can experience real-time advanced visual effects and 3D geometry. All right. 
are there uh, movie buffs here? Do you guys do you guys know what this is? Yes, exactly. 2001: Space Odyssey. Uh, that's a monolith. And so this is a, an example of uh, of using canvas as well. So the you know like kind of the psychedelic shape you see in the um, uh, colors you see in the background. Uh, this is done with WebGL and a, and, and a shader. And the shape, the monolith, is a very simple 3D shape. It really doesn't do justice to what WebGL can do because you know with WebGL you could draw a full-blown car with uh, with all the details and texturing uh, you'd want. Uh, the point we're trying to make here is that uh, you can define complex models uh, in the realm of uh, of WebGL, have the API do all the computation, and at the end touch the pixels the way you intended into this uh, you know big bag of pixel that the the canvas provides. So uh, again, it's very appropriate here because there is no tool in uh, you know SVG, CSS, or HTML to to do 3D models, and that's for the the monolith part. And for the the shader part, really, that's the kind of visual effect that you cannot express with you know with tiled element really. Uh, so you need a technology like you know like shaders to to express this type of uh, of effects. Uh, so there is use, you know, lots of use cases for for Canvas, uh, but you, you know, the 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 key thing to remember is that uh, once you opt into Canvas, it's kind of the ex, uh, you know the escape hatch, right? You're you're saying, okay, so the the most important thing for me is my rendering and controlling pixels, and the level of accessibility of uh, of that area is going to be fairly limited compared to regular web content, and that's you know that can be fine for for things like game. But you have to be very mindful, mindful that this is the type of decision you make when you opt in for Canvas versus uh, other graphical solutions. And now we're going to go back to, uh, to actually the world of declarative features for uh, for graphics, and we'll we'll follow Dave there. Ready, I am, Master. I'd like to try to bring these effects to the real world. Try? There is no try. Just head back and give it a whirl. Ah, uh, am I dead? Don't be afraid, Div. I'm Blend Modes. Simple opacity can't do this. Right, so you guys know Blend Modes well. As, as graphical designer, this is what you, know, uh, you use in Photoshop or GIMP or, or any graphics package, really, where it's a very common tool. Uh, what Blend Modes really do is you, you take the, the color of the background uh, and conceptually you put that in a, in a blender. Uh, then you take the color of the thing you want to draw, and you also put that in the blender, and you imagine that your blender has many buttons that control different ways of mixing the colors, right? And uh, here we, we push the multiply button uh, so that you get this, uh, this effect that's not possible with, with, with opacity and translucency. Uh, so it's very common for, uh, for, for graphic artists to use blend modes. They're very used to, uh, to apply them and it's you know conspicuously absent on the web, so that's one of the things we're bringing to CSS. There's uh, you know there's work in the CSS working group. There's a, there's a spec for this, and implementation has started on uh, you know in browsers. Uh, here you're seeing it uh, actually uh, applied live in a, in a custom build of Chromium uh, that's that's accessible from uh, html.adobe.com if you want to play with it. Uh, it's extremely simple to use. It's just a you know a blend mode property, and you set it to multiply, overlay, screen, whatever you. Uh, you think is uh, is useful. Now you may wonder, you know, well, why would I really need this as part of CSS? Why don't I just apply my blend modes in uh, in Photoshop and then use that image into uh, into my content? Uh, so there are several reasons. One is that once you if you apply things in a in a graphics authoring package and export as bitmaps, well, all you have is a, is again a bag of pixels, and you can't really make a, a, any sense of it. Um, and then and you, you lose flexibility. Uh, so for example, here the shape uh, is actually, uh, the shape color, the ghost, uh, has varying uh, shape color. So it's, and it varies from blue to kind of slightly uh, purple. But as the, the color animation is going on, uh, the blend is still happen happening. So I don't need to go reopen Photoshop for every single you know, step of the, the color animation and, and generate the effect I want. I can just you know, separ express that I have a CSS a color animation on the shape, and then specify the blend mode I have, and all the, the graphical magic happens. So it's actually quite, you know, quite powerful uh, in itself. So, uh, so that's for blend modes. Uh, very simple, but yet, I think, powerful feature for, uh, for the web. Now, there's something that uh, has even more flexibility and, and something I'm very excited about that's, uh, that's coming next. 
Okay, this is progress, but what about distortion? What about all the cool effects I can picture in my head? Oh, that princess is in another castle. Welcome, Div. We've been awaiting your arrival. What is this place, Princess Shader? It's where I bring it all together. Here, I can do vertex distortion and per-pixel color manipulation. So that's called CSS shaders. And CSS shaders uh, is one of the variations of filter effects on the web. So if you pick this uh, spec called CSS filter effects uh, 1.0 that's in the works, uh, there are three levels of, uh, of filters. There are basic filters, uh, which, which are starting to be you know, pretty well implemented. They're on iOS. They're uh, in Chrome and Chromium. Uh, they're, um, and they're coming to the other browsers. Uh, you can do things like drop shadow, grayscale, sepia toning, uh, you know, very basic, basic uh, pretty fine filter effects, and you can specify parameters uh, on them. So that's, that, that's kind of nice. Um, and then the second level of filter effects is SVG filters. So in SVG, you have uh, filter primitives um, where you can uh, do like you know, a Gaussian blur, you can do an FE composite, you know, color matrix, all, all kinds of things like this. And you can arrange those uh, filter primitives into a, a composite filter and then apply that to your content. So if you, if you remember uh, using Photoshop 4, for example, when you were doing, um, uh, I don't know, an inset shadow in, uh, in Photoshop uh, 4, you used to you know, apply a blur, then uh, do a masking, uh, then you would clip things. And you know, uh, there was uh, multiple steps of, uh, of operations you would do in Photoshop 4 until you had the, the desired effect. Uh, think of SVG uh, primitives as that level of functionality. Uh, they, they, they basically allow you to do every single step of those things you used to do in, uh, in Photoshop, combine them into one effect, and then apply that to your content. So that's very powerful. Um, there is a third level of, uh, of filter effects that we call custom filters or, or CSS shaders, which harness the, the power of the GPU. You know, a, a lot of devices and, and computers today have a GPU, and GPUs are able to run those little programs uh, that are um, uh, graphical mavericks uh, called shaders. And the shader is something that runs really fast uh, on a lot of pixel or on a lot of coordinates. Uh, there are two types of shaders. One is called vertex shader uh, that allows you to distort geometry. So for example, if you give it a, a sphere, uh, in your vertex shader you could like, you know, distort and, uh, the, the different coordinates on your, on your sphere to give it a, like a rougher look, for example. And the second type of shader is called pixel shader, where uh, at the end of the pricing pipeline, once the, uh, the, the, the rendering engine has computed the, the color of pixels, it feeds that pixel by pixel to the, to the fragment shader. And the fragment shader has an opportunity to actually change the color values uh, for each of the pixels. And that's very powerful. You can do you know, all kinds of, uh, of manipulations. Uh, here, the, the little princess uh, looks like a frog, really. but. Uh, the, usually it's princes or frogs, but uh, that's, that's odd. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the, the kind of floating skirt, uh, the distortion of the floating skirt is done with the vertex shader. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually the basic uh, shape is a circle, circular shape, and we just apply a vertex shader to make it kind of uh, float. Uh, later on, I'll show you a demo of, uh, of this in, uh, in, uh, in action on a, on, on a prototype tool. So that's the end of the, of the journey. Combined almost. with all our friends, this is where we explore the limits of the graphical web. This is what I'm talking about. Now let's get creative. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's the hope is, you know, this will unleash creativity. You can, you know, uh, use all those features. A lot of them uh, you can use today. You know, the, well, it depends on what your browser target is, of course. But in, in the spirit of progressive enhancements, uh, the, the fraction of browsers where you can use a lot of those features is growing. Uh, you know, every day. You can use SVG, in a, you know, starting from IE9 and then back on all the other browsers for, for, for a long time. You can, of course, CSS and HTML you can use everywhere. Canvas is available. Uh, Canvas 2D is available widely. WebGL is around the corner. Uh, and then the other features like blend modes and, you know, custom filter effects are, are in the works and coming soon to a, a browser near you. Um, I wanted to show you that uh, prove that I actually use CSS um, HTML5 graphics to build this. Um, so I'll do an inspect element on, uh, on div. I'm going to do something pretty cruel to div. Uh, I'll take it apart. So 
this is one, uh, so you see div is actually a div. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, here, div, that's my div, all right? And inside div, we find uh, inline SVG content. That's here, and for example, I'll pick uh, this one, its head. And since it's, you know, it's a DOM and everything, I can manipulate the DOM and I can do something like removing uh, an element. And now uh, div looks somewhat different. Um, um, so that's for, that's for div. Uh, same thing for, you know, CSS. Uh, you know, we can go manipulate it, uh, change colors, for example. So I can take uh, uh, fill color on, uh, on the CSS lady and change its color to, uh, to white, for example. And now she's got a, yeah, uh, not so great look, but uh, <laughs> uh, she looks different, certainly. Um, but that's, you know, that's kind of uh, powerful things you can do. And this is, uh, again, available in a browser. This presentation is actually available on, uh, online. You can go to the, the graphicalweb.org, and that whole presentation will run in uh, whatever browser you have uh, and will you know, gracefully degrade. It will tell you if it hits a feature that's not available. Uh, it will tell you where to get it. But, uh, but you can go through the whole story uh, on the browsers, on any of the browsers. So the, um, whoops. So div, as I was saying, is, uh, is an HTML element with inline SVG. Uh, CSS is used around the presentation for all kinds of things. Uh, colors, uh, styling of the graphics is done with CSS. Uh, and a lot of the animations is done with CSS animations. Like you, you see the, the, the kind of the little things that are happening uh, in the background here, like you know, blinking eyes and moving circles. This is all done with uh, simple uh, CSS animations on like, you know, on CSS transforms or, uh, or, uh, or colors earlier for, uh, for the blend mode uh, character. Uh, SVG, so to manipulate the SVG content, we use a library called D3.js. Uh, Anybody has used D3 here? Yes? Do you like it? Oh, yeah. Yes? It's lovely, isn't it? Uh, so it's been developed by uh, Michael Bostock. He, he now works at New York Times. Uh, he's a data visualization uh, wizard. Uh, he's done multiple iterations on, on developing data visualization frameworks. Uh, D3 is the, his la latest conception, uh, even though it's, it's several years old now, but it's, it's kind of the, uh, you know, the, the result of, of several uh, iterations on, on designing great uh, data visualization frameworks. And that's what we use here to, uh, to manipulate SVG. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's really powerful, and it works with HTML and SVG alike. So check it out. Uh, it's a very nice way to do uh, data visual visualizations, but also all kinds of, uh, of things graphical. Uh, next one, three transforms. Uh, you know, the effects are, are, are really cool, I think. Uh, you, know, you can move things around uh, in various ways, but it's very simple. It's, it's just a 3D transform. And uh, it's applied at the top of, uh, of, of basically the scene uh, that, the, that the DOM tree uh, represents. So it's, uh, there's not a lot of, uh, of rocket science there. It's just a simple property uh, applied to, uh, to the content. And Canvas, um, we use processing.js. Anybody ever use processing? Yes, a few hands. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, likewise. I really, uh, re I'm a big fan of processing because it's uh, be because of where it came from. It came from uh, Casey Rios and Ben, ben Fry, uh, were uh, you know, an artist and a data visualization guy. But it's really people who define their tool. Uh, they're creatives. Uh, they didn't find the tool that they wanted for uh, for doing creative graphics at the time on Java. And uh, they went out and built it. They built their language uh, called processing, and then built the implementation, all the libraries, and grew a, a really th uh, thriving community around it. Uh, it was all Java-based, but now there's processing JS that lets you run processing files on uh, on uh, on Canvas on the web. Uh, we used it because it has a lot of uh, libraries like particle systems, etc. So it's uh, it's very uh, it's very convenient, and you can do things like this. Uh, this Galaxy guy we, uh, we did for this presentation. Now WebGL, uh, the, uh, I don't know the percentage, but I, I, I'd assume it's at least 80% of any WebGL content I've seen is, is using 3JS. So if you're intending to do uh, WebGL content, 
uh, unless you're a really big fan of doing all the boilerplates yourself, uh, I would really advise using uh, 3JS. It's a, it's a great library, very powerful. And of course, here we use you know, a, a tiny fraction of what it's uh, capable of. But if you go to the 3JS website, you'll find a lot of really cool, uh, very sophisticated content built with, uh, uh, with it on top of WebGL. And then blend modes. Uh, blend modes is uh, is very simple. Uh, you know, it's just one property. It's called blend mode. Uh, it's applied to the element. No no magic here. And then finally, custom filters. Uh, I'm going to jump into a demo in a in a moment. And then uh, yeah, finally, uh, this is a uh, you know been done by CJ on our team. Uh, CJ is a really wonderful uh, creative uh, who works at Adobe in our team, and he. Uh, uh, so he's done all the heavy lifting on this presentation. He's worked with a bunch of people, like you know, voice artists, etc., to you know, do the character and the, the dialogues we have. Uh, and we had a lot of the people uh, in our team who work on the specific features, kind of contribute to uh, you know, writing the right shaders and uh, you know, debugging the, uh, the features we were uh, working on. So this has been a, a team effort. And I'll, uh, I'll show you uh, a few more things. Uh, a few more demos. All right. So the next demo is on Chrome. I'll show you something called CSS Filter Lab. Uh, so you, Okay, so this is a, a tool. Uh, it's an experimental tool. Again, it, this is available online. If you uh, if you do Google CSS Filter Lab, you'll end up on this, and it's hosted on HTML.wb.com. Uh, what this tool is is uh, is kind of a playground for filter effects. So what you see on the right hand side is uh, is actually HTML content, and I you know for it I can select text, and you can apply. Um, a filter effect, so the filter property to the content uh, through the, the user interface. So the user interface exposes two types of filters. There is the, the basic filter, the built-in filters I was talking about, and then uh, the custom filters. So let's start with the, the, the built-in filter. You can do things like a, like a blur. And uh, so the UI shows you both the, the syntax that you would put in your CSS for that uh, the element you're trying to blur. And it gives you a, a you know set of parameters that you can uh, play with. So I start you know we'll we'll start with a heavy blur, and I say that at the end of this uh, the the a transition effect, for example, we'd like to remove any uh, any blur effect. So if I now play this, uh, I'll have you know a transition I might want to do in a in a user interface, and the, this little tool gives you. Uh, the syntax that you would have to put in your uh, CSS animation uh, effect. Uh, all right, uh, so those are uh, you know basic filters. You get you know, things like uh, you know, saturation or uh, grayscale, for example. So we could start uh, you know the effect with a full grayscale, and then say that at the end we remove the grayscale. Now if I play it. Again, and it's going to go from you know, blurry and gray to crisp and colorful, which is what we want. Um, all right, so those are for basic filters, and those are, again, available, uh, starting to be available on, uh, on phones. Actually, I have that, if anybody is interested, I have this on, uh, on, uh, on my iPhone. I have a, ver a mobile version of this tool on, uh, on my iPhone that I can show you. Uh, unfortunately, I, I was not able to set up my computer to uh, replicate my phone. But I can show you after the after the talk. Uh, the other type of custom filters we have is uh, is custom filters. So there are a um, number of things you can do with custom uh, with custom shaders, uh, and this is the crumple one. So you know this looks like a crumple paper, um, but it's still CSS, uh, still HTML. So I can still search the text or select it, and I can do you know all kinds of things. I can you know uh, move it in in 3D. Uh, thank you. And same thing, you know, I, I can do uh, animations on it. So, you know, I can say that at the end of the animation, I don't want to have any of that effect. I want to have no rotation. Uh, so basically, I want to be back in, uh, you know, 
working order, and then what have I done? Uh, okay, yeah. Sorry. Well, right, it's reversed, but uh, so you can do uh, you know a little effect like this. Um, you know, it might convey some uh, specific meaning for a particular user interface. Um, you can do things like uh, a page curl. This is I really like this one. Um, where you can you know change the curl direction, uh, play around with this. Um, you can do things like uh, scrolling effects or unfolding effects. Like uh, curtains is a uh, is kind of a fun one. Uh, you know we can turn this into a, a, you know a little curtain effect and and have your your content unfold. Uh, another one would be a scroll uh, rolling scroll uh, where. Uh, you know, I could do an effect where I start here. Ah, start on my first animation frame. I'll start being rotated. Say scale a little less, and then at the end of the animation, I will have you know, unfolded, be back to normal. Like so, and again. So I could have a little reveal moment in my user interface, for example, to show the uh, unscrolling of the scroll. <laughs> uh, all right, so you get the you know the idea, and the the UI lets you play with it, uh, and then cut and paste the uh, the content. That's that's the way. Uh, I actually use this myself in when I do presentations, uh, which I write in HTML5. I actually use uh, the filter lab to kind of prototype effects that I use. And then I cut and paste the code and put it into my sound sheets for, for the particular transitions I, uh, I want to have. So you can check it out. It's on html.adobe.com. Uh, the um, uh, other demos I wanted to show you is uh, another example uh, that CJ uh, just did. Uh, there was a conference in, uh, in San Francisco this weekend, uh, uh, late uh, this week, in uh, Thursday, Friday, called Devil's Street Conf. Uh, you know, one of the beauties of conferences is that you know you can attend some and you can attend some at the same time because they're you know they're video recording. So uh, the videos for Dell Street Conf will be posted very uh, very soon, and I really encourage you to check out uh, CJ Christopher Gaiman's uh, talk. Uh, he covers a lot of ground on the future of uh, you know online reading experience and the kind of features you can do. I picked one of the demos he showed at the conference uh, because this is all uh, built in, um, uh, you know, with uh, with SVG and uh, and just you know features that are are available in uh, in browsers except one. So this is using uh, you know SVG images, and I you know I have a little bit of uh, physics engine going on here, uh, and I I can use this to you know do storytelling. So here the you know the idea th uh, that CJ wants to demonstrate is. Uh, he can use regular web features uh, or, or features that are about to hit the web uh, to, to create a very different user experience and something that you know uh, can scale, adapts to many devices, etc. Uh, so that's another example of something pretty creative that you um, uh, you know you can do on the web uh, or will soon be able to uh, to do. So we're we're really heading towards a much more uh, you know uh, creative environment, and I'm I'm really looking forward to see what uh, uh, what you know. You all come uh, come up with, and the kind of uh, really creative uh, content we'll see. So we we've heard a lot of talks during this uh, uh, this conference that I really enjoyed about uh, like design thinking and you know how to be uh, have a lot of empathy for your users, and I I couldn't agree more that those things are really important. Uh, at Adobe, we actually apply those uh, those principles when we we come up with our products, uh, especially in the uh, the edge tool family that we're. Uh, Working on in our organization, um, but the, I, I think there's also something about play. Uh, I think play is really important. Uh, it's very important to sometimes not think too much uh, and experiment. I, I, I think those two things go hand in hand. Uh, sometimes you, you know, just go have fun and, and explore with uh, with the technology. Just push it. Try to do things, and and you know maybe one day you'll find a use for it. Uh, so I wanted to show you just a conclude this talk with uh, two little experiments uh, that, that I did myself. I had fun doing it, and I thought I would uh, share those with you. Um, the first one is uh, it's called Quotes. And um, I'll just let you uh, uh, listen to it, actually, because uh, there's music.
can bid me up after this. Thank you. Um, thanks. I'm glad you enjoyed that. Uh, it's also solemn, uh, and I wanted to uh, end on a on a lighter note. It's the end of the conference. It's uh, it's party time. It's uh, time for every uh, one of us to go meet friends, uh, family, and have fun. And uh, I have a little demo that's a little more, uh, a little bit like party time. Uh, it's called Audio Eggs. And I'll show you what that is. So one of the things I find really cool with, uh, with web graphics is, um, is generative art. Uh, so that's something you find a lot in the pressing community that we were talking about uh, earlier. Uh, basically, the idea of generative art is you know, computers are really good at uh, rerunning the same thing over and over again. And you can you know, change the parameters, have a little bit of randomness in them. And that's what I've done here. Uh, you know, all those eggs are generated uh, dynamically from very basic shapes. Uh, the, the, the egg shape itself is just uh, two busy curves where there's a little bit of randomness on the, on the control points. So they've, they've got slightly different shapes. Uh, the colors are slightly varying, again, uh, again randomly, and the eyes as well get you know, shifted a little bit. So they, they kind of all have a you know, slightly unique Look, there's no uh, two uh, shapes that are the same, and I, if I actually like select one character, like you know, zoom in on one, and then I'll reload the page. So, do you see that it's not the same? Right, I'll do it again. Look at uh, maybe this guy. All right. So when I reload the page, it should not be the one the same. All right. Is it different? All right. So um, anyway, I thought this was fun, and it's uh, you know at the time I was trying to learn a little bit about uh, uh, the the Web Audio API. So I thought I'd combine the two, and this is what it camp was. All right. <laughs> so that concludes my talk. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. Have fun. Uh, go check out html.adobe.com and our blog. Thank you. Take questions? Yes. Hey, sir. Uh, I have three questions for you. Yep. One is, um, you showed that um, the ghost, right? Um, w what is the difference? How uh, we can easily achieve that using? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We can easily achieve that using uh, color transition and uh, um, CSS opacity transformation. I, I mean, giving a how how blend comes here and. Yes. So the when you do uh, opacity, the the the. The combination you get uh, between the background and the foreground is is just a linear interpolation of the two colors. So you take, you know, it's basically alpha times the first color plus one minus alpha the second color. Uh, this is really what you get. Um, the 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 blend modes lets you do things like multiplying the two colors, which which gives you a different result. So you cannot like the the multiply effect you cannot get with uh, with opacity because it just doesn't combine the the, the, the color components that way. And uh, the next thing is, um, you have used many uh, libraries. One is the 3.js, progress progressing.js, uh, 3.js. Won't those libraries conflict with each other? When 
Well, yeah, so uh, your question is, I use a lot of libraries and are there uh, conflicts? So uh, it depends on how you use the libraries, but you know, here it's loaded in a way that there's no, uh, there, there's no conflict. Uh, also, it's a little bit of an unusual uh, situation, right? The, the, the narrative was trying to hit on all of those different aspects. You know, typically, I'd expect that you use one or maybe two, but not, certainly not all of the, what was there in this presentation. Yeah, as every library doesn't support all the, a single library doesn't support all the things, right? Uh, yeah, that's that, that's right. It's, they're meant for different things, right? Like like there are uh, you know, different libraries for uh, for different aspects of, of CSS, like you know templating or uh, or DOM access, for example. Yeah. Final thing is, uh, what is the performance aspect? I hope you wouldn't have uh, measured it, but what would be the performance on browsers and how how will it work on other? I guess this should be a Chrome Canary version or. Uh, yeah, this is this is a, it's actually a custom build because we uh, we have the blend modes in there. But if you try a canary build, most of the content actually runs in it. Okay, can, can, is it possible for us to get this build by any chance? Yes, it's uh, so if you go to html.adb.com, uh, you'll find uh, you you go to the web standard section, and then there there are sections on blend modes, filter effects, etc. And there are pointers to the builds where you can uh, that you can experiment with, like the custom. Uh, the custom built. Thanks. Hi. It was an awesome presentation. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, hi. Big fan and great talk. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, so when I started my career somewhere in 2004, 2005, that's when Firebug just launched and jQuery was just about getting popular. Yep. Uh, and that was good because then I figured I for the next five years or so I've grown with the industry and I've learned it as it's coming. But for front-end engineers who are entering the industry right now, there is just so much. There are 30 different things that you can do with the browser and Things are happening on a daily basis that every browser developer is trying to catch up. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to these people? Because frankly, I find it hard to talk to them and tell them to pursue a career when there are 50 things and half of it hasn't been standardized yet. What would you tell these guys? So uh, is your question about? It's very overwhelming. It's very intimidating, the amount of the stuff yeah. that you can do with front-end engineering right now. So what would you tell to somebody who's entering the industry as a developer right now? Um, so so on the overwhelming part, uh, it, it's hard. I mean, I, I, I agree, and I, I have the same feeling, even though I, I you know, I, I didn't just start, but I'm still, I still feel it, you know, pretty overwhelming. Um, the, you know, I, there, there's a number of things people can do. They, there is, especially with social media today, you can, you can follow people who are on top of, uh, of what's happening. You know, people like Paul Irish or Divya Menon or. Like some of the luminaries in the field are, are pre, you know, have pretty good guide, guidance about what's happening in the, on the web. Um, then, if you're if people are wondering about like what feature is available, where, and the kind of level of support, there there are good resources like Can I Use? Uh, you know, it's a great place to go check. You know, what the level of support is, or Quirks Mode is another one uh, that that you, that you can go uh, check. Um, and certainly, I, and that really resonated with me uh, because it was said several times during the conference. I'd encourage people to, even though it's overwhelming, is to remember to think for themselves. So it's not, bec it's not because your friends are using this you know, cool new uh, next generation JavaScript library that you should, right? Um, we see that a lot, for, for example, when people use, uh, uh, it, nothing against jQuery mobile, right? But a uh, great library, but it's not always the right tool. Uh, so if, you know, if people make the, the choice to blindfully use what their friends are using or what they hear, uh, you know, it's not necessarily the right thing. So, all right, thanks. Well, uh, as an person that I believe uh, touched, uh, that were, was touched uh, web graphic very closely, uh, could you give us uh, some sort of prediction uh, or what the web graphic will be in a year or two or three year what 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 could we uh, the web developers uh, uh, will well what, what how do you think uh, where the web graphic will will move to, uh, in uh, two, in the next two three years yeah. so yeah so my uh, <laughs> of course it's the kind of things where you know the, and, and can, can you stop the video? <laughs> um, all right, I'll try. Uh, 
so I, my hope more than my prediction is that we'll, we'll see features, like declarative features come more and more in, uh, to, to CSS. So I, I like the expression 2D meets 3D, uh, meaning that things like shader effects, for example, I, I really like because it's exposing to, to CSS, so a fairly simple uh, declarative way of, of reaching out to features, something that's like hardware accelerated and a very powerful feature. So I hope we're, we're gonna see more of those uh, things in uh, percol up in, uh, at the CSS level. Now, two, three years is, sh is actually a relatively short time for standards. Uh, so if in that period we see CSS shaders being implemented and deployed in the, in the major browsers, I'd be very happy. Uh, I'd be very happy if we see blend modes getting, uh, getting adoption and, uh, and a new revision of the Canvas APIs. I think that's, that's really what we need. I think we'll also need, uh, we'll also see a better adoption of, of WebGL. I, I, I think WebGL is, is kind of unstoppable at this point. So I think we will see, you know, all the security issues, get, we'll, I think will get resolved, right? or I hope will get resolved, and then we, they will get enabled in, uh, in browsers. The, the other thing is, uh, is on typography and, and layout. Uh, I didn't talk about this, but uh, in, uh, in our group at, at Adobe, in the, on the web platform group, we have different themes we work on. So graphics is one. Uh, the other one is layout. And I think layout, uh, layout will evolve a lot on, on, uh, in the next two, three years. Because all, th there's been a you know, large number of specs, a huge effort being put in things like you know, flex boxes, uh, a grid layout, uh, at Adobe, we've worked on something called CSS regions, uh, which you know, it, it, I think is really essential for separating content for, from from the layout. Like the the, uh, the gentleman who to, uh, talked earlier today, you know, was showing how when you uh, you do responsive design, you may want to rearrange your content in different ways. Well, the region is a really key tool for that because it lets you you know define flows of content separate from where it fits on the, on the page, and that you know that's not. It's more layout than graphics, but I expect those things to become more mainstream. All right. Uh, excuse me? Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. so you're talking about the security aspect of the WebGL and all, like yes. how secure it is. Like you're directly accessing the GPU from a browser. So uh, what is the current status of the security of all these features? So, uh, so I'll start with, uh, with WebGL. So WebGL, uh, I had a number of problems. Uh, so th there are a number of attacks you could make with WebGL. You know, for one, for example, would be I, you know, I'll create a crazy shader with uh, you know, variable names that are so long that I'm going, I'm going to cause overflows and, and crashes in the GPU system. So this has been addressed by like doing shader rewriting. Uh, no, no browser implementation takes a shader and puts it on the GPU. That, that nobody does that. All the shaders are actually statically parsed, rewritten, analyzed, variable names are changed, and, and then once it's, that part is secure, they, then they, they're, they're put on the, CP, on the GPU. Um, there are other uh, issues with drivers that were not, uh, just not secure enough. Uh, so uh, so that, that, that's been you know, addressed by blacklisting a, a number of, uh, of drivers. So you know, WebGL is just not available when, uh, when you're hitting those, uh, those drivers. Um, and then there has been issues with um, basically denial of service attacks. So if you, you know, if you start having something that takes too much time on your GPU, uh, then basically it locks up your system. So the Kronos group has been working on like watchdog solutions and different operating systems have different measures against this. So for example, uh, you know, Windows has, uh, has actually system level APIs to try to reset the GPU. Uh, but there, there are things that have been worked on on Kronos to address, uh, address those issues. Um, so my understanding, I'm not following Kronos uh, as closely, but my understanding is that there's, there's been enormous progress on, on, on the security aspects of WebGL and that it's now be, uh, you know, ready to, uh, to be enabled and, and safely so. Uh, for CSS shaders, uh, we, when we proposed the, uh, the feature, uh, there, there, is, there was a gap in, in security. So there, there's one thing that we didn't realize when we, we brought the feature that people could do something called timing attacks. Um, and basically, that was you know uh, giving them a way to infer what information was being displayed on the screen, uh, which is a, which is a security breach. And that that's been ad addressed in the uh, in, in the in the standard uh, currently, and there's no uh, known security issue at this point on on CSS shaders. It's uh, it's it's on the par with uh, with WebGL at least for the for for the type of risk you may have from a, from a shader. Hello. 
uh, it might have been already told, but uh, I would like to repeat that it was a very pleasing and uh, very educative. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I had a question around uh, the SVG part of it where you started uh, focusing on the S and the V part of yep. the graphics uh, and why it's good. You also touched upon accessibility at that point. Yeah. Uh, though I'm not, uh, I'm not convinced it would make sense here because it's actually you are addressing a particular sense, uh, visual or audio, and then even though you can add attributes or you can add uh, more semantic description, uh, I don't see them blending and making sense for someone who has an uh, visual issue, uh, vi visual uh, visually comprehending the picture. I don't think adding any semantic uh, description would add value. That, that's a good point. I, I, th I think you're, the way I understand your point is uh, the you know, uh, accessibility is not the, the, the reason why you would pick SVG in that case, and you're right. Uh, the, the reason why we use SVG in this case is because of the script, you know, like DOM access and, and the styling system more than accessibility, because you're right. It's, a, it's kind of a whole experience, and at that point you're, you're, you're beyond like uh, data visualization where, where it, the accessibility argument is actually uh, prime, but here it, you're right, it's, it, it's not the, the main reason why you would pick SVG. But uh, have you seen examples or have you used where actually it added a lot of accessibility value? Uh, uh, yes, I, I, I do. I, uh, so in a previous life I worked at Oracle on a data visualization uh, solution. And we had, um, so we're doing uh, you know, all kinds of visualizations for, for, for Oracle products. And Oracle being a you know, big company was very strict on, on having accessibility. And it was, uh, you know, we, we, we had all the, the hooks in place for SVG so that we, you could, with a screen reader, actually go through the, the visualization and actually get pretty detailed information about uh, the different aspects of the graphic. And that was really easy to do in SVG and excruciatingly hard in other technologies. So, um, no, no, yes, well, essentially yes. So you, essentially you can set it up so that it will go to the, to the uh, information rich parts of your graphics that are, that are meaningful for, for a screen reader. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Hi. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, I have a question about CS3 regions. Yep. Uh, how is the progress considering that Designers like Eric Myers don't. Eric Meyer don't like it. Eric Meyer don't like uh, regions. Yeah. Uh, okay. I I didn't realize he didn't like it, but uh, uh, I I thought it, there were he had comments on some aspects of the of the spec. I don't think it's a he, blanket statement. He said that the flow in the data flow is not proper in CSS3 regions. All right, I, I, can't, I can't really comment on that because I, I haven't seen uh, the, the argument. I, I doubt it's, a, it's just a blanket statement saying that it's... Uh, it's you know, not it, really a blanket statement, I agree. Yeah. But it was something along those lines. He said it on the Big Web Show with Jeffrey Zellman. Sorry? He said it on the Big Web Show with Jeffrey Zellman. Okay, I, I, I'll have to check it out. Thank you. But I disagree. <laughs> Let me just elaborate on this. So the uh, the thing is, pe people have sometimes preconception on regions. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's the case here for Omar. He, he may have valid arguments. I don't know. But uh, uh, sometimes people think that regions have been proposed by Adobe from uh, a background in print, and it, it's totally not not suitable for for the modern web. And you know, it couldn't be less true that that, that perception because the uh, the way it originated at Adobe was at a, at, totally not from the printing side of, uh, of the company, but quite the opposite from people who were doing you know, uh, online digital publishing for the web and had been doing it for years. And they came up with regions because it was solving a, a big need for them uh, when they were trying to lay out content uh, responsively and, and have the, the layout adapt to different you know, aspect ratios and, and, and device resolutions. And they found that the ability to, to separate the flow of content from the, you know, the places where it was going to be a layout was, was an essential tool to achieve that. And there is consensus, really, that this, this core feature of separating you know, the, the, the name flows 
uh, from the where it will uh, end up on the on the page is really needed because without that th that ability, uh, really you, you're left in HTML uh, where you have to break down content in elements statically, right? So so there there is a binding between the content you want to display and basically boxes where it, it's going to fit because that's that's what it is. Where you start using flows like Regions has. You actually you, you, you make a lot fewer assumptions. You say, I have my content, and then I'll have a set of boxes where I need to flow. But if you reduce this, you know, uh, the size of one box, then the flow is going to just go and be pushed further down on the, on the, on the following boxes, the, the, the chain of regions. And that's an essential tool. So you know, there's been a lot of debate about the syntax and you know, how far we push you know, certain aspects of the features. Uh, but you know, I haven't heard recently that many objections on the core concept of, of needing to separate the, the, those two things because you know, clearly having the content bound to specific boxes, I don't think a good thing. Cool. Um, so my question, considering Adobe Brackets and the animation stuff you showed today and your hints at Chrome OS, am I wrong to assume we're getting the impression that the web will replace desktop applications at some time because it seems like we could end up with Photoshop inside the web browser um, yeah that's probably gonna take a while but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the I mean certainly the, I, I I don't think it's a replacement I think it's an evolution I, I my personal take on it but it's, it's not necessarily uh, you know representing Adobe's uh, perception of the company but I think we're evolving towards a uh, you know, model where, if you, if you look at the desktop applications, for example, on the, like Office Suite, I think what's ha what happened with the transition to the web is a lot of failed attempt, attempt to just redo Word on, on, on in a browser, and that just you know it, it fell on itself. It was just too heavyweight. The thing that I think is successful is Google Docs because Google Docs says, okay, we're not going to try to 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 do. Um, uh, a word processor that can where you can write a book. We're not going to try to shoot for that. But a lot of our users actually don't write books. They write you know one or two or three or ten page documents, but not much more. So we're we're going to address this and really well, and then we'll use the web for what it's good at. So like for collaboration features and, and things like this. So it's a you know there is fewer features, there are other features, and it's it's kind of a different experience and a different uh, different model. I think the the same will you know happen with creative tools. Okay. Cool. Thanks. So um, I'm sure you, there's lots more to learn, and I'm sure you want to talk more. But that's close for now, and you can continue connecting both outside as well as over the internet. Well, thank right. you very much, Vincent. Thank you. Thanks. So quick. Uh,